Well, hi and good morning. Thank you for joining me in my shop. Hey, it's been a couple days since I've been in here. I've been busy doing lots of other stuff, including looking for my uh, vacuum tubes to see if I do have the right replacements for the tubes that are in this radio. Although this point has been made many, many times in the in the uh, comments, um, I'll just point it out again. See these glass tubes that are here. There's another one back here. Uh, on the schematic, they're called uh, metal tubes. So uh, I, I doubt I have a replacement for them, but I have quite a few metal tubes I need to go through. And uh, I can't find them. I don't know where they are. They're somewhere in this house. I found all my other uh, tubes um, that I have in my, uh, my stock, but I could not find my bag of metal tubes. It's somewhere. So I can't swap the tubes. I'd really love to do that right now. Put metal tubes in here, see what's hap what happens. Can't do it at the moment. And that's one of the reasons why I haven't been in here for a couple days. I've been hoping the tubes would show up. Well, I did other things, but they didn't. So, on to other stuff. Um, the, the volume control. I've had a, a number of comments around the volume control. I think, you know, I'm certainly well aware there's something going wrong inside it. Got this resistor on it to kind of settle it down a little bit while we're doing testing. But the question has been raised a number of times, is this thing properly grounded? And I never really addressed that question. And the reason is because it's easy to see, easy for me to see, here in the shop, coming right off this lug. This last terminal on the uh, control is a bare wire which goes straight to the chassis. There it is, it's all intact. And I even went so far as to test it and uh, everything is fine. So the volume control is grounded, just as shown right here. It's just like that. So, uh, you know, I got a long list of uh, potential guesses here. Uh, microphonic tube is included in that list. I'm not so sure it's microphonic. I haven't noticed any ringing, you know, when I'm tapping or moving around or banging the radio. I haven't noticed any any of that. Uh, to me, the sound is, is very much an electronic signal type uh, feedback and oscillation. I don't think it's an audio type thing. So what am I going to do here? Uh, I got to do something. I'm going to put another. I'm going to do uh, what I'm going to do today, and then, assuming that doesn't solve or reveal the exact problem, which it probably won't, I'm going to set the radio aside in favor of some other work I need to do. And uh, in the meantime, I'll find those metal tubes. They're going to show up sooner or later, and then we can get back at this radio. So I think what I'm going to do here is a little bit of signal tracing in the radio, <coughs> and. Uh, and my shop is only partially set up here. I'm going to do it using a scope and just looking at the uh, at, at the various signals that show up. So here's my my scope is at the ready, just waiting here. So uh, that means this radio is going to be on, making its terrible chirping sound, which means I better close the door to my shop here. The neighbors are going to think that there's fire trucks coming here or something like that. Okay. So I, I, I think we should just really kind of get down to it here. Um, just before I turn the radio on and get going, let me just figure out what exactly I'm going to do. So I think the oscillation is, is being set up somewhere in here. Not really sure though, but I think that because when I touch the grid cap on this tube, the oscillation stops. So maybe it's a simple matter of poking around with the oscilloscope a little bit in here and just seeing where the signal is and where the signal isn't. Uh, my guess is we're going to find it all over the place in this radio. Um, but let's, let's check it out. So we'll maybe start with the plates and the grids. On these tubes my scope may interfere with the uh, with the grid when I connect to it. So I may not get a good uh, result off the grid. The, the uh, impedance of the circuit is very high, so my scope may interfere with it. Let's give it a go. Let's get this guy squawking here. I suppose there's other ways I can quiet down the, uh, the speaker. Okay. 
quick look for safety. Let me just get my scope clipped on here. Just going to put the uh, ground side of the scope to the chassis. Now, in my shop, everything is plugged into an isolation uh, transformer, including the oscilloscope. So I have no earth ground anywhere. Just for those of you who are wondering. And I think we're ready to go here. Just now this is the mystery capacitor is still disconnected up here. Which I really need to investigate better what is going on with that capacitor. But let's go poking around and see what we can find here. Okay, switch on. Give it a moment to warm up. Maybe I can find a setting of the volume or the tuning where the uh, feedback and the oscillation isn't so ear piercing. There we go. Anytime now. That's not so bad, even like that. It's very quiet. I don't know why it isn't screeching at me. Sounds like some pleasant drumming. Okay, very faint. That's great. I'm not going to fool with it and end up getting a big loud screech in here while I do this. So let's <clears throat> take a look at the scope here. Make sure I've got it set right. I'm gonna make it fairly insensitive and fairly slow. So that's a uh, scope is completely disconnected, and that's just the hum that's present here in my shop. I say it's disconnected, but in fact, it's huh. I guess that's what happens when you don't ground when you have everything isolated from ground, from real ground. Okay, so I may be learning some uh, incidental test equipment lessons here in an ungrounded shop. So, first I'm going to connect the scope just to the chassis and make sure we get a nothing. Okay, there's a nothing. That's good. Here, I think you can watch both things going at once here. So I'm just connecting to the chassis and course it disappears. Look at that. Hand effects and everything. Hey, the radio's gone completely quiet. What to think about that? It's never been quiet like this. Uh, what is that? itself. Let me turn the volume here and see if we can... There we are. That's kind of interesting. You could see something on the scope there. Now, i got to teach myself some stuff. Because my scope is not uh, grounded like the third prong on the uh, outlet you know, power cord is not going anywhere anymore. Um, be interconnected with anything else that has a ground plug that's plugged into my power bar. Uh, it would not include this radio. The radio doesn't have a, it's not a three prong plug on it. But I guess with it ungrounded, the signal can be fed to the scope through the ground lead. Not much different than being fed through the signal lead. A little bit of learning here. 
So where should we start? Let's start right on the volume control. Why not? Oh, I said it would start on a grid. Get this guy chirping here. acting like a shield there. I bumped the grid there for a moment. should try tuning the radio. <laughs> wow, that's screaming out to put a shield back on me. for my scope work at the moment. I think what I'm going to do here, I turn the set off, I'm going to pop out these tubes here. I'm no longer convinced they're making good contact. Good pin contact. Pins look fine. Checks. Now I expect that to say OK. Checks OK. I don't know what that says, but. Made in Canada. Pins look fine again. This radio comes to life properly now, I will be thoroughly embarrassed. 
while we're doing it, might as well do the last or first too. Also. Now. So this tube has something on the inside of the glass envelope. You can kind of see through it. I don't know how, yeah, it comes across pretty good on the camera. You can see, like, they've sprayed a coating on the inside of it. I wonder if that's a shield of some sort. A8, I think that says there. Yeah, A8. Clean them with your finger. It's probably not the best idea to run your finger over them. But. Ah, there still is that one old paper capacitor up here. By the, the tunable inductors that uh, I've left in, but I kind of doubtful that could have anything to do with the uh, oscillation. So let's turn it on again. Wow, it's not sh it's not a shrieking banshee like it used to be. What has happened here? So there's multiple oscillations in this radio. I mean, there's the one you can hear, the high pitched garbly thing, and then when I tune the radio, Radio's at full volume. So I, I think I'm uh, wiggling the output too. I'm just making and breaking the output uh, of the radio. I think there's zero output right now. Whoa, look at the strings about to dismount on the control down there. Radio is more fun like this than it would be if it worked. So the the center terminal is the feed to the uh, amplifier. That's kind of just what I would expect to have happen. And we 
can't hear the oscillation doesn't mean it isn't happening somewhere in the radio. So I'm going to put the scope on the grid cap of the detector. So it's actually on the sort of the preamp triode, if you like. Just watch what happens here. My scope just a little more sensitive. And my scope is set for uh, AC, so it's not going to show any DC voltage. And I'll wiggle the volume control here. Where's all the noise gone? Wow, I can hardly move that control anymore. If I saw an easy way to spray some uh, WD-40 into this control, I would have done it already, but there's no easy opening to get at it. Now, it's either gone quiet because I've hooked up the scope and I've just nullified the signal at that point, or more likely something else is going on. a fine mess. You can hear it very faintly putting away. radio signal to me. I'm injecting it with my finger. Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I don't know what these results really indicate. Let's try this grid cap here. Well, that's kind of interesting. It doesn't seem to be affecting the uh, oscillation at all when I clip onto the grid of that too. But this one. It's kind of interesting how it comes back very slowly also almost suggest some kind of bias thing happening here, bias problem. Now, I think I checked the... Uh, oh! How come that stopped? That's pretty weird. I thought I, I banged something totally different on my on my bench. Oop, oop, oop. Calm down, calm down. the output tube here. Man, 
man alive, she says, like, anything at all gets changed in this radio, and it changes this, this problem. It makes it really hard to narrow down where a cause might be. Oh, did you see the speaker? I don't know if you saw that just now. looking at some plates here instead of the grids so it's uh, pin 3 on all tubes pin 3 <laughs> pin 3 on all tubes is a plate okay so we'll start with the uh, why not the audio output tube Just exploring uh, this connection here. Sounds like a little bit of teletype. trying to determine if it's this soldered connection itself or if it's the two pin contact with the uh sensitive there. Get something better to poke with. Try this. else it seems to be extremely sensitive. Not so much. Now I'm just trying to make sure that because I'm moving this, I'm not being fooled and something else is being moved a tiny amount and that's where the real your fingers there, Jimmy. I almost got him in the radio. Okay, we've got to do something about that connection and get it to be proper. I can't tell if it's when the, bolt, when the radio is oscillating, if the connection's bad, or when the radio goes silent, the connection's bad. I can't tell which way. So that's a pretty easy thing to fiddle with. Just let my soldering iron heat up there. 
Now, if it's a tube pin contact, I can't I can't solder my way out of it. Um, but uh, it was nice in my old shop when I knew where everything was and everything was within reach. Not quite like that here yet. What did I get this for? And there's a resistor hidden back in there. Green, black, yellow. Testing this one before. Green, black, yellow. I think that's 500k. It's coming right into that area, 600. Okay, sorry, irons, plenty hot. There's a lot of free pe oh, okay. Lost a chunk of solder there. Lots of uh, free pieces of wire on this on this connection. Can't all be from me. Wow. November 11th is coming. It's November uh, 7th today, I think. November 7th, yeah. November 11th, Remembrance Day. And uh, around Remembrance Day and again on June 6th, the anniversary of D-Day, I usually spend some time thinking about my father, who was a soldier in the Second World War. I usually watch a couple of uh, documentaries and some other stuff I do to kind of remember remember my father passed away just a few years ago he was in his 90s and uh, so I'm talking about him a bit here while I'm doing this he uh, he never talked about the war I never knew anything about it until I was an adult until it was a mid 90s in fact I knew he landed on D-Day, and I knew, you know, some huge number of soldiers went into Europe on D-Day and basically turned the war around. It started the uh, beginning of the end for the uh, Second World War. Went on another year, I think, before it really ended. I cannot get that little piece out of there. But what uh, 
he would never tell me any details. He just said he couldn't remember. But what I found out was he didn't just land on D-Day. He was in the very first boat. The very first boat uh, in the sector that his getting anywhere here. Like he landed with 400 Canadians on the beach and he was in the first wave. There were 11 boats, 40 men per boat, spread over I think 300 meters, which is a uh, quarter of a mile. Oops, something like that. And uh, of course he survived because I'm here. Um, he made it across the beach the thing I've learned, some of the stuff I've learned is that uh, in the Canadian case, anyway, they landed 400 men in the first wave. And it was a long time before the next wave showed up. A couple of hours, if I've got the story right, which is, it was at least one hour. But I've got two sources now, one saying it was about an hour, another one saying it was more like two hours. 400 men on the shore, um, at least... 150 of them were wounded or killed right away. So we're down to like 250 men uh, fighting. Um, now, if you're American, I know a lot of Americans watch my videos, so you know all about Omaha Beach, a terrible uh, situation for the Americans. Uh, got, got to be the worst of all the armies that landed. American, British, and Canadian. But the next most difficult beach was Juneau Beach. I got it out. Juneau Beach where the Canadians landed. Um, I just have to think about my... Uh, I've watched these documentaries and I realize I'm watching my father's story. Okay, so now you know what? That resistor lead, it's hard to see is completely free of solder now. Let me get the close-up camera here. Okay, so there you see the wire. Right in here. You can see it's just completely... All the solder just left, just basically fell off this. Never, you know, I've struggled to clean solder off of connections and old, you know, pieces of wire from previous things. It's always been tough. In this case, this stuff practically leaped off there. I wonder if that was a cold joint in there. Okay, so I just have to swing this yellow capacitor over and get it connected in there properly. doing this, I'm trying to scratch up the wire a little bit. Not sure I'm getting too much good scratching going on there. Really make a much better connection this way. pliers to do any heavy bending here. There we go. I really want to be sure when I'm done that this 
connection is not the problem. I doubt it very much to begin with. Look what I'm using for tools. I'm using pencils and pens, and whatever I can find laying around here. There we go. Okay, so now the resistor has a firm physical connection. So does that capacitor. Great, let's solder those in. That's the terminal where this guy was going too. Pretty sure. Yeah, so my dad uh, landed on D-Day. His job, the first wave's job, was to knock out what was left of the defenses. And if you know the D-Day story, you know the defenses were supposed to be destroyed by previous bombing, extreme bombing. But it didn't work. It didn't work in the American beaches, didn't work on the Canadian beaches. And I don't know much about the British. I think the British landing forces actually had a fairly easy time of it compared to what happened to Americans at Omaha and Canadians on Juneau Beach. Um, now he went on to fight for a whole year after that. Um, all through Holland and up into Germany. Uh, he was part of this big battle for the city of Caen, which is a British-Canadian battle, so if you're American, you've probably never even heard of it. those chunks of solder that went falling down into this radio. Come on out. There's one. There's a little piece of wire there. Could this have been from a cold solder joint? Okay, this guy is soldered up wonderfully. Almost got a short there. Okay, let's give it a try. <laughs> okay, let's see. I wager 25 cents that this fixed the radio. But I would wager more that it's changed the way the radio operates. I think I would lose both bets, but then feeling crazy here. Here we go. Okay, power on. What will come forth from the speaker? Cardboard shaking from that. Well, it sounds like my snowblower when I started it up there a week ago. It's running good. There we are. <laughs> it sounds more like a radio. Okay, let's let's fool around now and see what we can. Terrible things we can make happen. Okay, same basic nonsense going on. That's gone. So that resistor, uh, deep down there, must have been a cold joint. Which is good now. Okay, let's put this capacitor, the mystery capacitor, back on there.
See, like sometimes when I when I interrupt the sound, and then I take away the interruption, whatever it is I did, the the uh, oscillating doesn't come back instantly. It comes back very slowly. It comes back slowly, like some voltage is building somewhere, and then that voltage is somehow affecting the radio's operation. So. You know, a wild guess here is I'm fooling around with the grid potentials, the grid bias, and maybe when the grid bias is at one extreme, the amplification in the tubes is minimized and the oscillation goes away. There isn't enough amplification in the tubes to keep the oscillation going, or, or what? Or I don't know. Let's try it again. I'll show you just what I mean. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll fool with it by attaching this capacitor. Now, when I remove it, it's not instantaneous. That really sounds like a, like a, a you know, I don't want to say, well, I was going to say ABC. Uh, feeding back or something on the ABC line ABC line that is this line here top of the point oh five Which point oh five? There's one here and there's one down there. Yeah. Uh, oh, I've got this indicating meter back here. this meter to the ABC bus and watch it a bit. So it could be here. Yeah, no, I've got this on DC negative, so I expect this meter to go upscale when I hit the right spot. So we're seeing a negative voltage, a grid bias voltage. Now I'm going to do that little capacitor trick. Where is it? Where's my tool? Look at that. See the voltage go up? Radio went quiet except for the putt putt too. And the more negative the bias, the less amplification from the tubes that these uh, this uh, ABC is affecting. So uh, it really suggests that the ABC line is not being nullified by this capacitor properly. Put the scope right on this point too. Okay, let's peek at the scope here.
not much going on there. Now what I'll do is I'll connect that capacitor again. There we go. not telling us too much more than we already knew with just the uh, meter. So the jumping AVC voltage is going to be because the oscillation is coming through the IF, going through the detector, uh, being rectified and generating the voltage which eventually appears as the AVC voltage that we're looking at. So what am I really proving here? Um, why would this little capacitor have such a big effect on that? This capacitor appears to be uh, connected to this tube, but it's not. It's a uh, free pin. It's being used as a connection point. Coming off of it is a couple of wires. Oh wait, that is that is a ground point. Yeah, definitely. There's a ground wire there. Something a little less. Another pretty busy connection here, boy. It's just purring along now. Okay, fake shielding. close to working at this point. Uh, now I turned the IF adjustments all over the place at random. second I'll just double check the focus here. And now I gotta find a little a little screwdriver. days of not being not working in here my, my tools have wandered out all over the house so I have no idea where these should be set. Look at that eh? I think it's alignment time here. Um, turned it and it squeaked and then it just went away. It's changed entirely.
Now, of course, if, if the IF is not resonant, if the IF transformer is not conveying a signal forward, then any oscillation that was working its way through that would be interfered with, and I would knock it out by just, just detuning this. I'd be knocking everything out. That's an interesting sound. Oh, well, to do an alignment here, i got to set up quite a bit more equipment um, to get that going. So I think I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to set this radio aside in favor of another job. Keep my eyes peeled for those metal tubes. Cross my fingers, I have some. I can pop in there. Uh, next time I'm on the radio, if I don't have the metal tubes, or whether I do or not, I'll be doing an alignment. We'll just see where we can get with that. I don't have a lot of faith, but uh, I'm really pretty stuck on this thing. <laughs> really pretty stuck on it. Okay, so thanks for watching, and uh, see you in the next video.